If you haven't met me yet, my name is Ty. I'm one of the pastors on staff, and I am so privileged to be here with you sharing the word. But before I do that, I love hate this. Right when I'm standing over there, God just starts telling me things, and he's like, I need you to do this, and I need you to say this and do this. And I'm like, that's not in my notes, God. Like, I have a very strict flow that I've been working on all week. You had that time on Monday to tell me. It's too late. But he's like, no, you're going to do it anyways. You're going to do it anyways. So here's a couple of things I want to do. Number one. Real quick, we're going to pray for Pastor Brent and Hosanna because they're on vacation. We want them to rest well. Amen? So real quick, God, right now, I thank you for who you are. God, I thank you for Pastor Brent and Hosanna and their leadership to this church. God, I pray that as the Bible says that we would be a blessing to them, that we would be people that um, are an encouragement, that they don't look at their job and say it's taxing, but they are excited at the the opportunity that God has given them, the the privilege of responsibility God has given them. Please uh, bless them as they are on vacation. Help them rest. Help them to see all the cool things, uh, but not too cool because we want them to come back. God, we love them. Uh, Bless them. In your name we pray. Amen. Second thing I want to do is I just want to like celebrate a couple of people. Number one, uh, Tony Dorr doing uh, tithes and offerings. Was that not awesome? She's one of our elders here. This is going to sound super weird, but I got, um, I sent a text yesterday and I got a text yesterday. I sent a text to Rhonda Potter, who's on the sound, and she's going to hate me for pointing her out, but you can all look at her. She's right there. She looks really cool. I texted her yesterday. I'm like, Rhonda, I don't know what to do. I don't have any sound people. I know you said you couldn't be there. Can God provide a miracle? Can you be there? And she's like, Ty, if that's what you need, I'll do it. That's amazing. Yesterday, or yeah, yesterday, Tony, that just lifted this table, texts me, and he's like, hey, man, what can I do to help you tomorrow? I'll do anything. I'll, I'll do whatever. And I was like, dude, if you could just lift the table for me. Like, I've heard of armor bearers. I need a table mover. Like, would you do that? And he's like, yeah, but can I tell you something about Tony that I love? He's the best friend you'll ever have. If you have not met him, you need to. Because this guy, like, has your back. He'll do things for you. He'll call you out if you're being stupid. It takes a real friend to do that. You guys think I'm joking, but it takes a real friend to do that. It's uncomfortable. Tony's a real friend. So can you give our elders a round of applause? They're awesome. The days are here, they're camping, and they drove all the way here to be at church. And I say that because of this, guys. We're going to do things a little bit differently today. When I got saved, I went to a church that was like, this is Pentecostal church. We're Pentecostal. We didn't look at our clocks. We didn't say, hey, God, if you could move in the next 45 minutes and then be done, we got lunch plans. We showed up and said, God, what are you going to do? And I love that. And I think sometimes I can be guilty of saying, hey, God, this is my job. I'm going to show up at nine, and then I have to do this, and I have to do that, and I don't want to forget my nap. And I can get so focused on what I need to get done and how I'm going to get out of here that I'm like, dude, you're before the living God, and you're in a rush. When, if you want to, the Bible tells us that if we want to be an elder, a teacher, that we want a good thing. He says that's what you should want. That's really good. I guarantee you none of these elders got where they are because they're like, hey, it's noon. It's time for me to go. Hey, I, you, that's not in my responsibility list. I'm not going to do it. If you're here and you're like, I want to be an elder. I want to be used by God. Tarry in the spirit. Show up. Ask what you can do. Be a servant. Spend time meditating. I love, we're talking about Moses. Moses' disciple, Joshua. It says that Moses left to figure out all the stuff that he needed to do. And Joshua stayed in the presence of the Lord and prayed. And we saw how Joshua was blessed in the Bible. Spoiler, if you don't know, he was really blessed. And so this is not in my notes, but I just want to encourage you guys. Let's let God move today. Amen? Amen. All right. That said, thank you, Jesus, for throwing that at me like five minutes ago. I appreciate it. That said, I love stories. One of my favorite classes of all time in Bible college was Pentecostal spirituality because we heard testimony after testimony from people that were evangelists hundreds of years ago to people in our class talking about what God did. I love stories. I love testimonies. I, I love books because they have stories. I love movies because they have stories. I like sitting around a campfire where you don't have cell service because you're stuck there just swapping stories. Stories connect people. Stories are amazing. One of the main reasons I got into cameras is because I loved capturing stories. See, I'm recently taking a film class, and one of the first things you, you learn in this film class is that every good story needs a climax. It needs a high point. The cool part about the story of Moses and specifically the book of Exodus that we're talking about is it has not one but three climaxes. There's the one we're going to talk about today, the parting of the Red Sea. There's the Mount Sinai experience where Moses goes up and comes back down with the Ten Commandments. And then lastly, there's the building of the tabernacle. There are three climaxes. We're going to talk about the first one, which I think is really good because it's probably the most famous, infamous story of the Old Testament. In fact, this story was acclaimed by a lot of people, like actors like Charleston Heston. It was like preachers like Martin Luther King Jr., 
cartoonists like Charles Schultz, who did the uh, Peanuts cartoons, animators like Walt Disney, even singers like Bob Marley sang songs talking about the parting of the Red Sea. See, but with all the attention that this has been given over the time that it's been around, there's been a lot of misinformation spread because it's been around for a long time. So when I talk about this, one of the first things I want to make sure we do is we get the story straight. We get the story right. And the first thing we need to know about this story is that the God who brought Israel out of Egypt is a great God. Can we agree on that? Amen? The God who brought Israel out of Egypt is a great God because he always knows what's best. He's always faithful to help us. He is always there to guide us. And he, the most importantly of all, and this is kind of weird for people, he is so great that he's able to do all that and still work it for his glory. See, the reason God made the world and the reason God saves people today is for his glory. Both creation and salvation are set apart for the glory of God. If that's true, then it has to be true of Exodus too. So when we're reading this, I think the theme we need to understand as we're going through this whole story of Moses is Exodus is all about this. God saved people for his glory. Let's jump into our passage. We're going to be in Exodus chapter 14. We're going to read out of NLT, and we're literally going to read the whole chapter. So my narration skills, we'll see how it goes. Starting in verse 1, the Lord gave these instructions to Moses. Order the Israelites to turn back and camp by the sea. Camp there along the shore. Then Pharaoh will think the Israelites are confused. They are trapped in the wilderness. And once again, I will harden Pharaoh's heart. And he will chase after you. I have planned this in order to display my glory through Pharaoh and his whole army. After this, the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord's. So the Israelites camped there as they were told. When word reached the king of Egypt that the Israelites had fled, Pharaoh and his officials changed their minds. What have we done letting all these Israelite slaves get away, they asked. So Pharaoh harnessed his chariots and called upon his troops. He took them with him, 600 of Egypt's best chariots, along with the rest of the chariots of Egypt, each with its commander. Israel hardened the heart of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, so he chased after the people of Israel who had left with fists raised in defiance. The Egyptians chased after them with all the forces in Pharaoh's army, all his horses and chariots, his charioteers and his troops. The Egyptians caught up with the people of Israel as they were camped beside the shore. As Pharaoh approached the people of Israel, uh, as Pharaoh approached, the people of Israel looked up and panicked when they saw the Egyptians overtaking them. They cried out to the Lord, and they said to Moses, "Why did you bring us out here to die in the wilderness? Weren't there enough graves for us in Egypt? What have you done to us? Why did you make us leave Egypt? Didn't we tell you this would happen while we're still in Egypt? We said, leave us alone." Let us be slaves to the Egyptians. It is better to be a slave in Egypt than a corpse in the wilderness. But Moses told the people, don't be afraid. Just stand still and watch the Lord rescue you today. The Egyptians you see today will never be seen again. We're about halfway there, guys. We're doing this. The Lord himself will fight for you. Just stay calm. Escape through the Red Sea. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the people to get moving. Pick up your staff and raise your hands over the sea. Divide the water so the Israelites can walk through the middle of the sea on dry ground. And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they will charge in after the Israelites. My great glory will be displayed through Pharaoh and his troops, his chariots, and his charioteers. When my glory is displayed through them, all Egypt will see my glory and know that I am the Lord. Then the angel of the Lord, who had been leading the people of Israel, moved to the rear of the camp. The pillar of the cloud also moved from the front and stood behind them. The cloud settled between the Egyptians and Israelites' camp. As darkness fell, the cloud turned to fire, lighting up the night. But the Egyptians and Israelites did not approach each other all night. Then Moses raised his hand over the sea and said to the Lord, Open a path through the water with a strong east wind. The wind blew all night, turning the seabed into dry land. So the people of Israel walked through the middle of the sea on dry ground with walls of water on each side. The Egyptians, all of Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and charioteers chased them into the middle of the sea. But just before the dawn, the Lord looked down on the Egyptian army from pillar of fire and cloud, and he threw their forces into total confusion. He twisted their chariot wheels, making the chariots difficult to drive. Let's get out of here, away from these Israelites, the Egyptians shouted. The Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. When all the Israelites had reached the other side, the Lord said to Moses, raise your hand over the sea again. Then the waters will rush back and cover the Egyptians and their chariots and charioteers. 
So as the sun began to rise, Moses raised his hand over the sea, and the water rushed back into its usual place. The Egyptians tried to escape, but the Lord swept them into the sea. Then the waters returned and covered all the chariots and the charioteers, the entire army of Pharaoh, all of the Egyptians who had chased the Israelites into the sea. Not a single one survived. But the people of Israel had walked through a middle through the middle of the sea on dry ground, as the water stood up like a wall on both sides. That is how the Lord rescued Israel from the hand of the Egyptians that day. And the Israelites saw the body of the Egyptians washed up on the seashore. When the people of Israel saw the mighty power that the Lord had unleashed against the Egyptians, they were filled with awe before him. They put their faith in the Lord and his servant, Moses. Let's pray. God, right now, I thank you for who you are. God, I thank you for this amazing story of many miracles God, of many divine miracles that you performed through nature, through people, and through your own power. God, we pray that when we hear the story, that we would come to know you. God, that we would put our faith in you, that we would trust you all the more. God, we love you, and we thank you. Do what only you can. And everyone said, amen. amen. All right, so I am on this binge on the Disney uh, Plus, I was going to say Disney Channel, but no, the Disney Plus thing, uh, where I'm watching like old movies from the 90s that I grew up with. And the other day, I watched Heavyweights. Yes. Have any of you guys seen Heavyweights? <laughs> this is a movie that could not be made today because it's about a bunch of kids that get sent to, for lack of a better term, fat camp to lose weight <laughs> by their parents. And when, when the one kid gets there, he's all like, all of the guys are like, this is great. You know, we sneak in candy. We have fun on the tubes. We have a great time. And what they don't know is the camp was losing money, so they had to sell it to Ben Stiller. Now, Ben Stiller is like my mortal enemy in this movie because he's an exercise freak. He's a vegan. He's like, don't wear shoes, do your thing. So I was like, maybe all my, my, my stuff comes from the 90s. I don't know. But it was interesting. But um, Ben Stiller is this guy trying to instill in them this healthy mindset, but he takes it too far. The kids rebel. He gets locked up. And eventually, <laughs> it just gets crazier and crazier. But eventually, his dad comes and takes him away. And he's all sad. And, and the kids win. And what I found interesting thinking about this is like, this movie seems weird. And I was like, I can't, I can't place my finger on it. No, it's not the, it's not the, it's not all the weird stuff, but like, why don't I like it? And I realized they don't make movies like this anymore. Because if you watch any kid movies nowadays, if you watch any cartoons, here's the first thing that happens. Eventually you hear the origin story of the villain and you feel bad for him. You're like, this guy's just misunderstood. You know, this guy's had it bad. He's going to be redeemed. He's going to become one of the heroes. And that's kind of a trope that you see in modern movies. That did not happen in Heavyweights. You hear bad things that happen to Ben Stiller, you, you should feel bad for him, but they make it a joke, and at the end, he's punished, and you're sitting there, and like, there was no redemption for that guy. Like, he just, just sucks to be him. Like, it's crazy. And I started thinking about it, and it's so interesting in our culture, we don't like to call things evil or bad anymore. We don't like to claim a spade a spade anymore, and here's the reason why this is a problem, is because God is glorified by the judgment of sin. And as soon as I say that, like, to be honest, it makes me uncomfortable because I'm like, man, people are going to think that I hate them. People are going to think that I'm mad at them. But the truth of the scripture is God is glorified by the judgment of sin. See, when God delivered Israel from Egypt, he did it so that he, so it was guaranteed he would receive all credit. We learned a couple weeks ago when I talked that Moses was a military leader. He was a strong man. He did all these things. Moses knew strategy. He knew how to win wars. And when God sent them, to this part of the sea, this is, this is t a terrible position. In fact, it says that they were pretty much across where they wanted to go already, past the desert, out of Egyptian territory, and God tells them to turn around and go back. And he says, not only go back, but go to this part where you're going to be in the middle of the desert, and you're going to have your back to the ocean, and there's nowhere to escape. And then all of a sudden, all the Egyptians are coming with their huge mass army. Now, if I'm Moses, I'm like, God, you're pretty cool, as a strategist myself, this doesn't make a lot of sense. But see, God was doing this so that everyone would know God did it. Not Moses, not the Israelites, not the Egyptians' poor strategy, but that God did it. See, not only was this position terrible because of all this stuff, but God was going to gain glory at the Pharaoh's expense. In fact, when you read the scripture, you see almost 10 times where God says, and I'm going to do this so that I receive glory. See, in order for this strategy to work, Pharaoh had to chase the Israelites. Pharaoh was back in Egypt. He's back in his palace. He's still mourning. He's still dealing with all the, the, the funerals and the boils and all these things. And it says that Pharaoh, in the midst of this mourning, sits there and he's like, wait a second. I let all my workers go. 
Who's going to build my monuments? Who's going to go fetch my dinner? And it says that his officials were even more upset. They're like, dude, we have to work for ourselves now. This is not a good situation. Like, what are we going to do? So Pharaoh has a change of heart. And what's sad about this is you would think that maybe Pharaoh repented. See, many times over the story during the plagues, Pharaoh was given plenty of ample opportunities. See, first he refused, then the plagues came and he began to try to negotiate, then he bickered, then he even asked Moses for prayer, be, having the audacity to say, Moses, please have God bless me. Finally, after the last plague, he, he lets them go, but you find that he didn't actually repent. It was a, like a, a decision just to get out of the situation that he was in, but he didn't really have his heart behind it. See, in Pharaoh's rebellion, is a warning against any of us who would make this kind of promise to God, like, God, I'm sorry, God, I'll change my ways because we're in a hard circumstance. But then as soon as things go good, we go back. How many of you guys know somebody like that? How many of you guys have been somebody like that? I'll be honest, I have. See, I had an uncle who when I first came to faith, uh, my little cousin got attacked by a dog. And he got, like, when I say attacked by a dog, it wasn't just like the dog bit me. Like, he was, he was messed up. We took him to the hospital. And I remember sitting there, and my uncle looks at me. He's like, Ty, just pray for your cousin. I said, yeah, I'd love to pray for him. And he says, tell, he's like, just, I keep telling God, if my son lives, I will serve him. If my son lives, I will serve him. My cousin lived. My uncle never served Jesus. See, we make those kind of commitments all the time. We make empty promises all the time. And that's what Pharaoh is doing here. See, what God wants isn't some temporary promise, isn't some emotional response, but God wants our total commitment to him right here, right now, and for the rest of our lives. Yes. See, here's what's interesting is Pharaoh's attack here kind of emulates what we see in a lot of spiritual attacks, and a lot of times Satan attacks Christians. See, Pharaoh quickly mobilizes his forces, and when Pharaoh, when Pharaoh mobilizes his forces, he gets the biggest, most advanced, powerful army in the entire world at this time. He brings the full shebang. He's, he's got so many soldiers, no one would even know what to do with. And not only that, but he is the most advanced military at this time. He has the technology that no one else has. And instead of looking to God in the situation when all these Egyptians show up on the horizon and they're like scared, the Israelites are disappointed because they don't, look, they don't look at God. They look at the enemy and say, we're doomed. See, this is disappointing because they had already witnessed God in Egypt doing all these wonders. It's also disappointing because literally the night before they left Egypt, and it says they did it defiantly, shaking their fist at them. Can you imagine that? Yeah, we're free. And then the next day you're over there crying, please, please don't hurt us. It's kind of embarrassing. See, Exodus is a picture of our own deliverance from the captivity of sin. See, in 1 Corinthians 10, 6, it says that these things in the Bible occurred for an example to us. When God rescues people, Satan tries to grab us. See, whether, whether, uh, whenever we commit to following Jesus, as soon as we do, we face doubt. We face temptation. We get pulled back. See, Satan wants to reach us. And Jesus even teaches this in his own his own teaching. He says the evil one will come and snatch away the seed after it's laid. He says also some people will suffer or they'll face persecution or they'll face troubles and they'll just spring up and die. Back in America's early history, um, many slaves would escape to the north. They would use like the underground railroad. They would find ways out and slaveholders would come up to the north, find them and drag them back to the plantation. It's horrible. It's terrible. This, in a lot of ways, can be used as an example of how Satan gets us. Yeah. We are set free. We run. Satan finds us and tries to drag us back to the plantation of sin. Here's the major difference, though, is there is no fugitive slave law in the kingdom of God. There's none. Once God sets us free, Satan can't take us back. We can only choose to go back. So what should we do when we know Satan is chasing us? I'll tell you what we shouldn't do. We shouldn't do what the Israelites did in this situation. See, the Israelites cried out to God, but it wasn't a cry of faith. It was a cry of desperation and fear. They did not believe that God could save them. And they even say in the story, we're going to die. See, rather than waiting for the God who's brought them this far, they immediately turn on the prophet of God. I find this funny because, uh, just to be honest, as a pastor, as a spiritual leader, I face this all the time. As soon as situations in people's lives go, don't go the way they want, they come attack me like I did it to them. Yeah. I'm like, I'm sorry, dude. No, this is your fault. See, when Moses, then Moses says, um, they go to Moses and they say, 
What is it because there's no grave in Egypt that you brought us to this desert to die? Which is kind of like the beginning of Jewish comedy, to be honest. It's sarcasm because this is funny because what, are, what, are, what, are, what is Egypt best known for? Military. Military, the pyramids. When people go to visit Egypt, they go to see the pyramids. What are the pyramids? They're giant tombstones. They're giant tombstones. They're graveyards to these past kings. And so when they're saying this to Moses, saying, there's, what is there not enough graves in Egypt? They're saying, dude, look at all these incredible graves we built. They're being sarcastic and ironic. See, they're basically telling Moses, we told you so. We told you so. They're sulking because they're not getting their way. Most alarming of all is they're willing to go back into their bondage. God had freed them, and they're right there saying, maybe Pharaoh will take us back. The whole point of the Exodus was for God to free people so that they could serve him. And in the first moment of hardship, they turn their back and want to go back to serving Pharaoh. This is more than just a loss of nerve. It's not them saying, uh, I don't know what to do. This is a serious lack of faith. A serious lack of faith. By pledging allegiance to the Pharaoh, they're denying the power of God. They're saying this Pharaoh with his army, with this technology, is more powerful than our God could ever be. See, God wants to bring us out of our sins. Our problem is the only way that that's going to happen is if we choose to follow him. No sooner do we choose to follow Christ than we face problems. No sooner than we choose to follow Christ than we lose our security. No sooner than we start following Christ do we face hardship. And you know what we do? Just like the Israelites, we go right back to where we were. We say, yeah, that was pretty bad, but this is hard. So even though that was bad and I don't like it, it's comfortable. I understand it. My wife makes fun of me because every time we go see a movie, I get a large Coke Zero and a large popcorn with extra butter. And she's like, Ty, every time you eat that fake butter on the popcorn, you get sick for like two days. And I'm like, yep. <laughs> She's like, so? I was like, I will take a large Coke Zero and a large popcorn, extra butter, please. And it got to the point where she's like, I don't even feel bad for you anymore. And I'm like, Rachel, I know all the other times that it hurt me, but this time is going to be different. You don't watch a movie at the theater without a large popcorn with extra butter. It's just, no, you don't do it. And she just rolls her eyes. As silly as that example is, that's exactly how we are in our sin. We, God frees us, we're delivered, and we go right back, knowing exactly where it's going to lead us. See, even, even though Pharaoh knew what was coming, uh, they were right where God wanted them. See, what was at stake here wasn't simply just the lives of the Israelites, but it was the glory of God that was at cost. They should remember the kind of God they served. We talked about at the beginning, the God that knows the best ways, the God that is always faithful, the God that stays to guide them. They're throwing a fit when God is literally in a fiery cloud above them to protect them. And they're like, I don't know what to do. They have horses. God promises that he's going to save us and he's going to do it for his glorious plan. See, Moses knew this because he responded, do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You only need to be still. See, so Moses gives three commands in the saying. He says, do not be afraid. Stand firm and be still. Something I found interesting about this is for uh, the, the grammar in here is called a negative imperative. So when it's the strongest form of expression in the Hebrew language. So when Moses is saying, do not be afraid, he's not being comforting. He's not patting on the back or putting his arm around and be like, don't be afraid, my friend. He's rebuking them and he's mad. He's saying, you moron, stop. Do not be afraid. Listen to God. See, they had no right to be afraid because they had no reason to fear. All they needed to do was literally stand there, watch God does what he does, and be obedient. That's literally all they had to do. Now, see, in a military situation, this would be bad advice. If anyone knew that this was a bad idea, it was Moses. He's like, when an army comes at you, you don't just stand there and say, God's got it. It's cool. But no, see, God was their warrior. And they just needed to stand and trust in his salvation. In this battle, they're not soldiers. They're not the heroes. They're spectators watching the glory of God pass by. See, the, the same principle holds true for us in our salvation. We are in a spiritual battle. And in that battle, the Bible gives us the same orders. 
In Ephesians 6.13, it says, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, this seems like a pretty evil day to me, does it to you? When the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. Isn't that crazy? Put on the full armor of God so when bad things happen, you can stand there and wait for God to do what God does. See, Satan is pursuing us, but instead of running away, all you need to do is stand there and trust that God's going to be your salvation. One of the preachers I love, his name is Charles Spurgeon. He says it really good. He says, I dare say you will think it's very easy, uh, an easy thing to stand still, but it's one of the postures which a Christian soldier learns not without years of teaching. I find that marching and quick marching are much easier to God's warriors than standing still. It is perhaps the first thing we learn in the drill of human armies, but is one of the most difficult to learn under the captain of our salvation. See, to stand at ease in the midst of tribulation and hardship shows a veteran spirit. It shows experience, and it shows a knowledge of grace. It is harder to be still and wait for God to work than it is to make attempts, attempts to run away, or to even try to put things in our own hands, saying our faith is by doing it ourselves. See, but God says, instead, God says to stand our ground. He is our defender. See, a rushing wave swept over the Egyptians, and they were killed instantly. And it says their body, this is the part that they didn't show on the Prince of Egypt, which I wish they would have, but I get it, it's PG. Um, now, after the waves flew over them, it doesn't just say they disappeared, but it says their bodies were laid along the shore. So they're literally standing there on the other side with all of their enemies laid before them. What happened to them at the Red Sea was divine, divine retribution. These men deserve to be punished for their sins. And see, this, is, again, is something that is hard for me because I'm all about, like, redemption. They're just misunderstood. They need God's help. But God is glorified when he judges people for their sins because this displays his divine attribute of justice. You can't have mercy. You can't have peace. You can't have holiness without justice. God was also judging the, Egyptians, the Egyptian gods at this point. See, there's this god that they love called Ra, and what was interesting and funny about the story is that it says that the Egyptians died at daybreak and Ra was the god of the sun. When Ra should have been at his highest pinnacle of strength, he failed them. The Pharaoh was also considered to be a god by these people. So they're literally being led by their god. And what's funny is according to the ancient Egyptian inscription, the Pharaoh says this, he whom the king has loved will be a revered one, a revered one, but there is no tomb for a rebel against his majesty, and his corpse is cast into the water. This threat was the Pharaoh to people that disobeyed him. He's saying, I'm literally going to drown you in water. What's ironic and poetic about that? Pharaoh gets drowned instead of them. See, God did this for the praise of his justice. God did this to say, I am just, I am right, and I am good. See, something similar to this will happen in the last days. When God returns, it says that he will look on the city of Babylon, the city of Satan, and he will cast a rock from the sky and put the city into the sea. And it says that he will do this for his glory and for our good. And immediately afterwards, all the angels, all the saints, all the prophets will get together and sing a song saying, hallelujah, salvation and glory and power be to our God for true and just are his judgments. God deserves our praise because he will give justice in the end. See, God was doing something more than judging the Egyptians. He was saving the Israelites too for his glory. How many of you guys have ever been on a sports team before? I've been on a sports team one time, fourth grade. My best friend was like, hey, I'm playing basketball. You should play basketball too. Now by my, you know, my looks, you're like, he's tall. He's used to be lanky. Uh, he's probably really good at basketball. No. I am not. And so when I get to elementary school, uh, they s separate people because this was, you know, before things were bad, but they'd separate us into the A team, which is the good team, and the B team, which is the bad team. And they're like, this is the first year we've ever had to start a C team, which is the really bad team. And I'm like, guys, captain of the C team, what is up? I loved it. So we'd go, we'd practice, we'd do all the same things. But when we get to the games, the C team would play like other C teams and the B teams and the A teams. Well, one time I showed up to, and all the games are on the same day at the same place because so it just made it easier for the parents. Well, one day I showed up to play my C game. And when they got to the A game, there wasn't enough players. And they're like, uh, Ty, do you want to fill in? And the other players are not 
excited because we're, for, we're fourth graders, man. This is serious. NBA is calling soon. They're like, Ty, I don't want Ty on my team. And my coach is basically like, either Ty plays with you guys or you don't play. And so like, oh, fine, Ty, play. And I'd love to tell you that I was Michael Jordan slamming dunks, doing all these things. I just stood there. Literally, my mom has a picture with me with my hands in my pockets <laughs> on the court, just kind of walking around, waving at people, doing my thing. I was like, I look good in the shorts. I got the jersey. What's up? I'm just standing there. I stole the ball once, ended up fumbling it, and lost it again. But our team won. And I was just standing there. I was, I was less than helpful, but our team won. And I was like, hey, I'm a winner. Team A champion right here. It's funny when we think about it like that, but guys, that's our salvation story. We're standing there practically getting in the way, not really being helpful. God's doing all this work and we get to celebrate with him in his glory. See, we may think we bring a lot of things to the table. God is gracious. He uses us sometimes, but God's the champion. God's the winner. God receives the glory, not us. We're just riding the bench on his team. See, God is glorified by the salvation of his people. Right when it was obvious that they could not save themselves is when God chose to save his people. The Lord said to Moses, are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. The hour of salvation has come. There is no more time for crying. There is no more time for complaining. It was time to get up and start walking. See, Charles Spurgeon again says this, far be it from me ever to say a word and experiment of the holy, happy, heavenly exercise of prayer. You guys heard me today. I love prayer. But beloved, there are times when prayer is not enough. When prayer itself is, a, is out of season. When we have prayed over a matter to a certain degree, it then becomes sinful to tarry any longer. Our plain duty is to carry our desires into action. And having asked God's guidance and having received divine power from on high, to go at once to our duty without any longer deliberate or delay. Guys, you should pray for the direction of the Lord, for the guidance of the Lord. But when he gives you a command, it's time to stop praying and start, it's time to start obeying. I've seen many people, I've been one of those people at times where we stand there and we get so caught up in praying and praying and praying. And God's been very clear on what we should be doing, but we're so busy being spiritual that we're not obeying the commands of the Lord. Could you imagine how silly it would be if after this you're like, Ty, what are you having for lunch? I don't know. The Lord hasn't delivered it to me yet. Okay, so you show up at your house and my wife's sitting there like, what are we going to do for lunch? I'm just going to pray and the sandwich is going to show up on my lap. No. Sometimes when you know the right thing, to do, it's time to stop praying and it's time to get up and obey. It's time to get up and obey. It's time for God's people to get up and get going. However, in this situation, what God asked them to do is a little impossible. You know, I can tread water, but treading over a sea is a little ridiculous. See, it was the darkest hour before dawn, both figuratively and literally, and they were backed up against the sea. It's the army in front of them surrounding them, an army that they, that could, they could never stand up against, and it's they're literally back against the ocean. What are they going to do? But Matthew 19, 26, this is a cute verse that we always throw around. It's so perfect for the situation. It says, with God, all things are possible. It's easy to throw that around when you're trying to untwist a, a hard pickle jar. It's a whole other thing when you've got your back up against an impossible situation and there's no going forward. With, with God, all things are possible. What brought... Israel out of Egypt was the power of God. God was the one who told Moses to raise his staff, who hardened the heart of the Egyptians, who protected the Israelites all night. See, it says in the verse, the angel of God, who has been traveling in front of Israel's army, withdrew and went behind them. The pillar of cloud also moved from in front and stood behind them, coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. Throughout the night, the cloud brought darkness to one side and light to the other side. So neither went near the other all night long. See, this pillar, this cloud is what's known in uh, fancy Bible terms as a theophany. And simply what it means is it's a visible image, a tangible, physical person with the appearance of the invisible God. In other words, this is Jesus riding up in the clouds. It looks like kind of like one of those 80s rock albums. It's pretty cool. So God himself <laughs> was in this glorious cloud. And Moses would understand this because Moses experienced the same thing in the burning bush. The bush is on fire, all this stuff, but it's God tangibly speaking to him in this situation. See, God was with his people to protect them. This wasn't just some cloud and fog between them and their enemies. This was literally God physically, tangibly in this cloud with fire on one side, lighting up the pathway of the Israelites and darkness on the other side and destruction for their enemies. See, the cloud was their guard as well as their guide. It moved behind the Israelites to shield them from their enemies. The Egyptians were ready to attack, but all night long, God kept them in the dark. On the other side of this divine blockade, the children of God were in the light. 
And this must have been some crazy darkness because it wasn't just like we have torches, it's night, we can see you because they're from, you know, pretty close. This must have been a dark darkness, a, a veiling darkness, a supernatural darkness. See, what distinguishes God's people from this world is we are in the light. We forget that we are in the light and God is always right where we need him to be to keep us safe. See, God was doing something that night. He was parting the waters and in a weird way, he was reversing creation. He was pulling back the waters to reveal land where it hadn't been so that they could cross. See, God was actively involved. Even the Egyptians knew that God was fighting for the Israelites. He was so supernaturally involved in the situation that during the last watch, the Israelites looked at the fire. They looked at God. They were thrown into confusion. Their chariots, the wheels were starting to fall off. They were starting to bending. And the, the Egyptians say, let's get out of here because the Lord is literally fighting against us. They're like, this doesn't make sense. They're, they're parting waters. They're running through. We have the storm. These fireballs are being thrown at us. We're trying to get through the sea and our wheels are falling off. We are losing people. We can't do this. God is fighting against us. See, God threw the Egyptians into panic by sending this storm, by beginning to trap their chariots, by bending wheels, by putting in mud, by pulling them out. And they're going, let's go because God is going to kill us. See, God promised both the Israelites and the Egyptians, that one day they would both know that he was God. The promise came true in this situation when the Israelites watched the destruction of their enemies and the Egyptians watched God wash over them with water, with his names, the last thing on their lip. The Bible sums it up this way. That day, the Lord saved Israel from the hands of the Egyptians and Israel saw the Egyptians lying dead on the shore. So how did the Israelites get saved from God? Not by the mere wind and wave, not by the poor strategy of the Egyptians or the failure of their technology, not about a sudden storm or even the water. It was the power of God that saved them. It was the power of God. He was the one that brought them out of Egypt. He was the one that drove back the sea. See, this simply shows that all of creation can be used for his redemption, that all of humanity, even in our brokenness, can be used for his glory. In the mystery of God's sovereignty, we understand that God can use whatever he wants whenever he wants. He can use creation. He can use us. He can use any means that he desires. See, the exodus happened the way it did, by God's hand, so that he could fulfill his divine intention. Why did God part the Red Sea? The same reason he did everything else in exodus, so that he could be shown glory. God announced his intentions from the beginning. Bef when he was talking to Moses before the Egyptians came down, before the waters parted, God said, I'm going to do all of this for my glory. What could be more glorious than God bringing his people through this water? What could be more glorious than God slaying their enemies? See, this is one of the most amazing things God has ever done because people are still talking about it to this day. They're still making movies about it to this day. Ultimately, the story of the Red Sea brought glory to God because it convinced the Israelites to believe in him, to trust in him. It says, when the Israelites saw the great power of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and put their trust in him and in Moses, his servant. See, God was fulfilling his grand purpose to save people for his glory. For that to happen, they had to trust him and they had to worship him. See, but notice the order here. It's really interesting. God doesn't wait for his people to trust him and then act. God acts. God takes initiative, and the people then respond in turn. See, as Christians, this story, this great escape, is part of our history of salvation too. See, but the difference is we've, we've actually experienced a greater escape. Because they've only physically escaped Egypt. We've spiritually been set free. We have been saved from sin through the death and resurrection of Jesus. Here again, God takes the initiative. It says that we were his enemies, and while we were his enemies, he died for us. God doesn't wait for our faith. God acts so that we will have faith. See, Jesus is the perfect symbol of what happened in the escape of Egypt. He says that um, as the end was drawing near, that Jesus described his death as the mass exodus of faith. Thank you so much. It says that Jesus is the new Moses who leads God's people out of bondage of sin and into the promised land of eternal life. See, here's what's dangerous. 
I've heard this message so many times, and here's what most preachers are, would do to you right now. They'd have you stand up and say, call out your Red Sea. What's standing in front of you? I need financial help. I got a bully. I got this. And there's nothing wrong with that per se, but that's not the point of this passage. See, it's like David and Goliath. The point of that isn't that you're going to take out Goliath. The point is that God is great. Yeah. See, the Israelites understood this, that it wasn't about them going up to God with their troubles any more than it was about how they should act every time they come to a large body of water. Every time you see the ocean, make sure it splits for you. That's a sign of faith. No. See, what this teaches us is that we need to come to God for our salvation. See, what happens at the Red Sea should bring us to Jesus. The only Red Sea experience that truly matters in your life, in my life, in all of our lives is the death and resurrection of Jesus that brought victory over sin. See, all that remains for us to do is do what the Israelites did. Fear God and trust him as we march forward. See, Jesus made this clear in John chapter 5, verse 22. He says, I tell you the truth. Whoever hears my word and believes has crossed over from death to life. I told you guys, I'm sick and tired of playing games, sick and tired of doing church. My friend Donnie, he used to be a pastor. He used to always say it this way, and I loved it. He said, you need to put feet to your faith. And so this morning, I want you guys to stand up, and we're going to do something a little uncomfortable. And if you're uncomfortable, good. That's the whole point of it. It's going to be good. Here's what I want you guys to understand. The Israelites could have stood there and said, yeah, I trust God, but I, I'm tired. I don't really want to walk through that sea. Hey, I trust God, but emotionally, I don't really feel it. So it would be faking if I walked through that sea. <laughs> they trusted God when God said to march forward. And so today I want to do something. I want to put some tangible physical expression to what's happening on the inside. And so if you're here, and whether you've made that commitment before that I'm going to follow Jesus, or whether today you're making it for the first time saying, I'm going to follow Jesus, I want you to come up here. I want you to walk up as a physical representation of what God is doing on the inside, saying, God, I'm walking out of my comfort zone. God, I'm walking forward. God, I'm trusting you. I'm following you. Help me walk through this Red Sea spiritually, physically. Bring me to you. God, as we step out, putting feet to our faith, just as the Israelites did, God, as we step out, I pray that we would have the same reaction, seeing your glory at work. We would be awe-inspired. We would put our faith in you, and we would trust you for the rest of our days. God, I pray for this group, as we have chosen to follow you, that you would bless us, that you would pour favor, that you would make yourself known through our lives. God, you can use any tool imaginable. You can use nature. You can use uh, divinity. You can use human humanity. But God, you said that you choose to use us, local church. I pray that we would come to you both humbly but boldly. God, asking you to make yourself known in this world. And God, to bring us with you. God, we love you. We thank you.